Hi, today is uh, Saturday, March 4th, 2023. I'm Jason Shapiro with CrowdedMarketReport.com. I've gotten some requests from people to sort of share some war stories, so to speak, uh, over the years that I've had in the markets and all that. I guess maybe they're somewhat entertaining to people. Um, what I'd like to do is share one that I think is somewhat entertaining, but more so it, it offers, uh, I think, some some great lessons about trading, about risk management, and about the whole thought process of this game that we're trying to play. And this goes back to the late 90s. I went to uh, London Business School Masters in Finance program, which was a one-year program. And just for the record, I, I did not graduate, but I did attend uh, the school for the year. And at the time, the biggest thing in trading was Solomon Brothers, which was a large investment bank who, who did typical investment bank things like M&A and, and brokerage and all that. but. Um, their big thing was they had this big trading department and they swung it around big time and they were real famous for making big bets and, and making big money. And the guy who ran it was uh, John Merriweather. And um, at a certain point, John Merriweather decided that he no longer wanted to make you know a few hundred million dollars a year. He wanted to make a few billion dollars a year. We were getting to the point now where hedge fund managers were starting to do that type of thing, and I guess he wanted to be one of them. So he left Solomon and he started a hedge fund called Long Term Capital Management, known as LTCM. And by the way, his time at, at Solomon Brothers was pretty well documented in a book called Liar's Poker, which I thought was a great book, very entertaining book. Um, but anyway, he left, he started long-term capital management where I guess he felt like he could get more capital and he could leverage more capital and put these trades on bigger and make more money. So Solomon Brothers replaced him first with a man named Kabe Alamoti, who was a professor at London Business School at the time, not when I was there. Kabe went to Solomon Brothers. He then left Solomon Brothers and joined a Japanese bank who must have given him a, bigger, a better deal. He joined Tokai bank and so Solomon Brothers had to replace him they replaced him with another guy who was a professor at London Business School who also was not there when I was there but when I was there his wife was a professor there and I went to her one day and said hey do you think I can go and meet your husband and she was super nice enough to make that happen and so one day I, I put on my suit and I went into the Solomon Brothers trading room uh, in London and sat with this guy on his desk for about an hour and again, this guy was a super nice guy, a uh, very low-key guy, very friendly. And at the time, he was probably, arguably, the highest paid guy in the city of London. He was making a few hundred million dollars a year, which was real money back then. And he took the time to speak with me. And, and, and at one point, he said to me, you know, how do you look at the market? How do you approach the market? And I said, you know, I look for when everybody's doing the same thing, because I feel like when everybody's doing the same thing, they're not going to make money. So if I can get the other side of that, I can make money. And he looked at me and, and nodded and, and smiled. And he said, you know, but there are times, just so you know, where everybody can make money. And I was like, okay, I, I'd love to hear it. You know, who am I? I'm some 26 year old punk. And this guy is like, you know, the king of Wall Street. And he explained to me that um, at that time, the euro was coming into existence. It, it wasn't a thing yet, but it had been voted in and they were going to implement it. And if in fact the euro came into existence, then all of the European interest rates were gonna to have to converge and be the same because they were gonna all be under the same currency. I'm making up numbers here, but because uh, I don't remember exactly what they were, but like Italian interest rates were at 10%, and Spanish interest rates were at 5%. So you could sell the Italian interest rate by the Spanish interest rate. And when they converged, when the euro came into being, you, you made a good return. And of course the risk was the euro wouldn't come into being, but what was really the downside, then the, the, those other rates would stay where they were anyway. And these guys knew the euro was going to come in. So that was the trade. And of course, rather than make that 5% spread, why not lever that up 10 times and, and make 50% on the trade, right? It's a mathematical certainty, so what, why not lever it up? So they were doing that. And so was, you know, the guy Kave Alamote at, at Tokai Bank. And so was... John Merriweather, a long-term capital manager, and, and whoever else was doing it. And they were massively leveraging this trade. And that's great. In the meantime, there was another trade that was similar that they were putting on, which was that at the time you could borrow U.S. dollars. And again, I'm going to make up numbers because I don't remember the exact numbers, but you could borrow U.S. dollars at, say, 5%. You could switch them into Russian rubles and earn, like, say, 10% interest on Russian rubles and then sell forward those rubles 
when that ended back to US dollars and still collect about 2% a year. And usually with the way the forward market works is when you sell a currency forward, it's gonna make up for the difference in the interest rate differential, so there is no profit to be had there. But in the Russian case, there was a profit to be had there. So again, they're making this mathematically free 2% or whatever, and they're leveraging that up a lot so that the 2% becomes a lot more. What they missed on that one was there's a thing called counterparty risk. The only people that you could do these Russian ruble forwards with in the currency market were Russian banks. And the Russian banks, before the trade ended, went bankrupt. So suddenly the people that you had these contracts with couldn't meet the contract. So your trade blew up, right? You had no other way to, to do these Russian ruble forwards. So they looked around and said, okay, what do we got to do? You know, we're losing a lot of money on this trade. How are we going to cover our margin calls and how are we going to cover all that? And the answer was, well, let's get out of some of this European interest rate convergence trade, which they then tried to do. The problem was there was nobody that could take the other side of that trade because they were so levered and so were the other people. They were so massively levered and the size of the trade was so big that there was no way to get out of that trade. They were dead, right? And a whole bunch of things went on. Everybody thought the financial markets were gonna blow up and the Fed stepped in. And I know at one point they were talking to George Soros about taking the trade on from them, which he didn't do. There were rumors that he actually turned around and shorted the trade. I don't know if that's true. It's pretty cool if it is, but they had nowhere to go. And so what they ended up doing was blowing out. You're talking about long-term capital management, which was the smartest money that there was on Wall Street, completely blew out. Solomon Brothers, which was one of the biggest and most powerful investment banks in the world at the time, completely blew out. You don't hear about that anymore because they don't exist anymore because of that trade, right? And the funniest part about it, or the most ironic part about it, is that had you held that trade into maturity, what in fact happened was the euro came into existence, the interest rates did converge, and you did make a lot of money. But these guys weren't around to do that. Not only were they around, they, they totally blew up because of it on a trade that was right. You know, And we've all sort of had things where we feel like, oh, I was so right on this trade and I didn't make any money. I was so right on this trade and I actually lost money. It, it, it'll piss you off to no end. But I was completely mathematically right on this trade. It ended up being completely right and I completely blew out my company because of it. That's rough, you know, think about it. And it, it was simply because at the end of the day, it was too crowded. There was no way out because it was too crowded. And that's the danger there of doing what everybody does. And not every time everybody does something, does something like that happen, but the risk is there. And who wants to be in front of that type of risk over time? Because it only takes once and you're gone, right? I'll give one other example of that type of thing which is a Swiss franc, um, I believe it was in 2005. Here's the chart, okay? And here's the commitments of traders data, all right? This red means the commercials were super long, which means the speculators were super short. And what happened here was the um, Central Bank of Switzerland came out and said they were going to depeg from the euro. They were sick of the euro going down. You can see the euro and the Swiss have been going down, 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 down. They were sick of the Swiss weakening because of its peg to the euro. So they said they were gonna depeg and people were massively short the Swiss. So we came in, I believe this was a Monday morning, Sunday night, Monday morning, and the Swiss went from somewhere in the 115 area, 115 and change, to the 140 and change area, immediately. And people blew out. A number of firms went out of business because of that trade. And again, this doesn't happen all the time. Look, this is going down, it's going down. I'm sure the fundamentals were justified why these European currencies were going down at the time and it's very hard to not be involved in it when all your friends are involved in it and they're making money. But you know what? Boom, you're done. It's over. There's no more trading for you because you blew out, right? This is the danger of being in super crowded trades, right? So anyway, that's kind of the story and that's the lesson. I hope you enjoy that. I'm more than happy to hear your questions and comments. Please join us on YouTube on Twitter, come to crowdedmarketreport.com if you would like to see a lot more information and get reports and see great COT charts and engage with some other people uh, on our Discord page. Uh, we hope to see you there. And either way, I, I hope everybody has a, a good week. All right, thank you.